Okay. Um, uh, hi again. Thanks for coming. Uh, let's uh, continue. Let me start with a, a recap of what we did yesterday and with a few comments. So we studied the uh, theory, we consider Arx theorem, which is a theory without production, and we showed that the amplitude was identical to zero. So first we consider analytic continuation of the uh, elastic unitarity by Mandelstam, which uh, then allows to express a double spectral density, which is a pure double discontinuity of an amplitude as an integral of a single discontinuity. And uh, then the result was that we found that uh, the fact that the theory is gapped use allows, tells us that say, in the direct channel, the spectral density should be, so if we start with elastic unitarity from 4 to 16, the spectral density should be zero below this curve. And then if we consider crossing, it should be zero below this curve. And then we, and of course, again, if theory was production, we only allowed to use this condition in the strip or in the strip. But if theory without production, elastic unitarity continues all the way. In particular, we can go to this region and then uh, use again unitarity to argue that the amplitude has to be zero. Now, a few comments. First, as uh, uh, Rajesh pointed to me that pointed out to me that in the, as we were doing analytic continuation, so there was this structure of the T-plane, and uh, so there was a Lehman ellipse, and, uh, which goes from one to minus one. And then as we continue, we, so there is a proven region of analyticity here. Um, but as we continue, we go here, and so we have to assume analyticity of the amplitude here. So this uh, I sort of didn't discuss this, but actually there is a there is a paper by Chong and Toll from again from the old paper where they close this gap, I believe. So if you assume no production, you can first establish extended region of analyticity, and then you use this thing. Second comment is that. Uh, we were saying there is no production at all, but actually you can say, uh, well, look at the argument. Uh, it seems that production, no production, say somewhere here is enough. And so this region, so where these two curves intersect is at point 20 m squared. So you don't need to assume no production all the way. Actually, the production should start already somewhere here. Um, yeah, so let's, that was, uh, what we discussed yesterday. And so today I would like to continue in this direction. So what is the amount of an elasticity that we need? So we know that there is an elasticity. So, uh, but before also I want to uh, quickly prove another theorem, which is known as the Gribov's theorem, which uh, you can uh, uh, formulate differently. Well, you, one way to say it is that relativist cannot be of constant size at asymptotically high energies. Another way to state the same theorem is that uh, if you look at the Lijin singularity in the J-plane, the fixed, say, fixed pole at J equal 1 is forbidden. So what do I mean by this? Well, if, uh, by size of the object, I mean the, the total cross-section. So if you assume that the total cross-section is asymptotically constant, it implies for the amplitude that if you consider discontinuity of the amplitude, you know by optical theorem discontinuity proportional at the cross section up to a func uh, factor of t. So you can ask, and uh, well, let me start with this original example by Gribov, people believe that the cross-sections might be constant asymptotically, 
So this would be describe an amplitude with a uh, constant cross section because if you divide by t, this would measure a cross section. Say even if you set s to zero. And so the question was: Is it possible behavior? And uh, Gribble's theorem is a statement that it is not possible. And the way you prove it is that uh, you uh, take this ansatz and plug it in this equation. And uh, what you can see is that, uh, so large t goes to infinity. It's the same as z goes to infinity. So let's look at the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the function of z. And what you find is that in the, in the left-hand side, you get z from t. Well, there is imaginary part of s. If you take double discontinuity, but let me ignore it. And it has to be equal to the right-hand side. And uh, in the right-hand side, I, I forgot to write the definition again of eta plus uh, minus, which was uh, eta time eta double prime plus. And uh, if you try to take a large z limit on the right-hand side, you see that you can check that the leading uh, contribution comes from a large, large eta uh, part of the integral. So uh, the integrals that we care about, uh, we can plug the expression for. Uh, for the asymptotic of the amplitude, if you care about large eta here, which controls a large z behavior. So this li linearity in t becomes linearity in eta. So we have integral d eta, d eta double prime, eta, eta double prime. And the kernel simplifies uh, to the following expression. So this z comes from uh, z minus eta minus because at large eta, this guy becomes one and two times eta prime, eta double prime comes from eta plus. Okay, now this integral you can evaluate. It's a um, simple integral, you can evaluate it explicitly. And you see that you get, if you do that, the leading behavior being z log z. Hence a contradiction. So that's a Gribov's theorem. Uh, now, uh, so in, in terms of Regge theory, is this kind of behavior, you know, in the Regge theory, your amplitude behaves as a GFS. So this behavior corresponds to, oops, I'm not doing that, uh, T to the GFS. So, uh, this type of behavior corresponds to a fixed pole in the J-plane. And uh, this is uh, prohibited. So amplitudes cannot, cannot behave like this in the asymptotically high energies. And also this theorem, it uh, shows an interesting fact that even though we started with elastic unitarity, which is something at low energies, and you might think that you know, it's an uh, elastic unitarity condition started its life between 4 and 16. Um, but we see that if you do the analytic continuation, the elasticity properties of the amplitude impose, this condition impose, imposes cons non-trivial constraint on the high energy behavior of the amplitude. But this was generalized, but this is not the unit that you elastic unitarity. Oh, this equation is elastic unitarity. Oh, because that is yeah, yeah, yeah. But now we're applying it here. We stay in the strip and we go to high energies. <laughs> so the same result can is was generated by Passar that you cannot have behavior of the type uh, t to some real number um, log t to some fixed q, where for some reason uh, the same argument excludes. Um, Q larger than minus one. So if Q if Q is less than minus one, somehow this kind of 
apparently this this is okay. Uh, Another comment that I haven't seen, uh, haven't found the discussion in, uh, of uh, Gribov's theorem in D dimensions, but it's um, simple to repeat the argument. And for example, if you do this exercise in three dimensions, this actually this goes through. I don't know what to see. What's the problem if, you, uh, if uh, capital D went like D log D? Won't you get Z log Z on the left hand side? Uh, yes, we get. Uh, we get uh, Say so here is z, z log z, but now we have uh, log eta prime and log eta prime here. Oh, so yeah. So. The statement is q cannot be bigger than minus one. Uh, yes, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's I'm quoting. That I haven't checked. That's a that's a that's a often quoted result by Frosar. Which uh, I haven't checked, but and um, uh, therefore people uh, thought. So usually uh, there is a, as you know, there is a frost R bound, which has a coefficient in front, which is pi over mass of pi and square. But if you look at LHC data and try to fit it with the log square, the actual coefficient is two orders of magnitude less. It's ten to the minus two times this number. Well, you can question first if you're allowed to fit it at the current energies. But then another interesting question you can ask, okay, well, uh, for us are bound, when you derive it, you do not impose elastic unitarity. So could it be that if you impose elastic unitarity, this coefficient in the frost R bound can be improved and the bound can be tighter? The question, the answer to this uh, question is unknown. And uh, also, so I don't know. <laughs> Sasha, sorry, could you repeat your conclusion, please? Uh, for large S fixed T scattering, uh, you had some conclusion about how, that, that the amplitude could not grow in some, some way yeah, as, yeah. as some so, behavior in S, right? So, yeah, so, oh. uh, so the conclusion is that, uh, say, for at large T, the amplitude cannot uh, grow linearly in T in this argument that I presented. In, and the power of T does not depend on S here. Because this is... Uh, I, but, but, it, it could grow like t to the power 1.1? 1 .1. Uh, no, this statement also you can generalize this argument. It could also not possible. So, so what is the final, the, the most general final conclusion, please, if you don't mind? I think the way uh, to state it usually is uh, you cannot have the fixed, fixed singularity in the J plane that controls the asymptotic behavior of the amplitude. Oh, I see. So if p was a... F in particular, so if p was a function... If P was a function of S, then you'd be okay. Yes. Yeah, then you'll be okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So one way. Okay. Thank you. Sometimes stated also, a fixed pole in the J plane cannot be the right behavior of the amplitude. Yeah. That's. Uh, the Q was sort of negative Q or something. That's uh, okay. That's. Uh, uh, let me not commit to that. Yeah. Okay. This is. Uh, <laughs> The, yeah, the, apparently for Asar studied some results and with some logs he found that it's uh, it's it's okay, but I have to say I haven't read it. I'm sorry. Um, sorry, one more question. For, let's say you do classical gravitational scattering, you would get T square. Right? Um, and uh, that, that's okay because um, because it doesn't take into account quantum corrections? I mean, how, how, how is that? Well, uh, here is a Again, uh, the, I think the crux of the argument is very quantum and uh, very heavily gapped in the sense that we started with elastic unitarity, which I'm not sure what is analog of this would be in gravity because gravitons, is, yeah. gravitons are massless, so all the thresholds are on top of each other. So the argument, uh, the argument just fails at the first line. Hey, but if I took the derivative interaction, the scalar Sorry? Sure. What would be the utility scale for that? So the D square is just coming from the derivative. S3 is given. Yes, but this is something you assume some other kind of theory, right? So as we discussed yesterday, if you assume that you have a satisfied Whiteman axiom, then the amplitude. You have dispersion relations with at most two subtractions. I think that will 
I think that's already ruled out. So if the amplitude, if the amplitude grows like a T square, if the discontinuity of the amplitude grows like T square, then the integral in the dispersion relation with two subtractions will not converge already. Okay, one more thing, should I yes. say that you have to be the function of F, then it's supposed to be... <laughs> Um, um, yes. That's um, that's a good point. The way I was, uh, the way I did the computation, it actually doesn't care. Yeah, well, it uh, looks like it, it's actually it goes through. So, any, any, if you have, a, if you would assume a fixed pole which depends on S, it, it, it looks like it doesn't work. Also, yeah, I, I don't know why uh, why it's usually uh, not stated this way, but this argument seems to go through, unless, uh, yeah, indeed, I, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't used that. Uh, it does not depend GFS. Is the usual high energy uh, You mean? Um, is there maybe a negative sign that's required? I mean, it could be maybe there's a sign. Uh, this argument would not would not go through if you had to prevent like, the minus one. T to the minus one. Well, if T to goes, to, if you have T to the minus one, then uh, the cross section will decay at higher energies. Will decay, yeah, because cross section is T over T. Okay, do you mind if I if I, I will re answer this question tomorrow? So, I will, um, but uh, so that's uh, that's the argument. I I, I don't know uh, the answer right away. So, and another example, which uh, so there is a so far I'm just giving. Uh, General arguments. So, but there is an example by um, Richard, who wrote explicit amplitude of this form f. Say there is some number of t u plus f u s plus f. Of Ts, where uh, f is given by the following expression f of t u, it's uh, 4 minus 4 minus u, and here you put e to the minus 2, whatever, 4 minus s one quarter. This is just a function, and you can check, they, they check numerically, half and half analytically. That it has all the right cuts. It, it satisfies uh, unitarity, but not elastic unitarity, and it does grow at uh, at high energies. If you look at the discontinuity in T, it's linear in T. So this is just a, this is consistent with what I said. But this is an example uh, where you have an amplitude which. Uh, uh, which exhibits this behavior, and it violates elastic unitarity. Okay, so uh, I wanted now to switch uh, to the next uh, next topic, um, which would be a, a version of analytic bootstrap for the S matrix, which is very similar in spirit to the what we do in conformal bootstrap, and also which will lead to some more quantitative prediction of what is the amount of uh, what is the amount of inelasticity which is required. Sorry, yes, please. Uh, this, uh, there's no mass that's appearing here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So that's uh, that would be. 
this one does not satisfy elastic unitarity even yeah. between four and square. Yeah, 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 it just does not satisfy elastic unitarity, yeah. And also, so what did we build in that landed us at the 60 m squared point and not 9 m squared? Uh, sorry, I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. I built in that there is no three particle threshold. Uh, remember, so in principle, if I have a stable particle, I can have a pole, and then I, I assume that it's a pseudo scalar, which is, uh, which, uh, which is, uh, I assume there is no pole, and then there are no, no odd particle thresholds. But I believe the argument should go through. Yeah. So otherwise, instead of a Four particle channel which opens at 16, we should, there should be a Landau curve that corresponds to the three particle channel. But the, the same, I suspect, go through. Okay, so let me move uh, uh, to this analytic. Sort of. uh, sorry, yeah, another, another comment is that um, uh, also based on the question by Rajesh, is that you can ask what is the analog of this in CFTs, and recently the, there was a discussion of double discontinuity for CFTs, and double discontinuity for CFT corresponds to single discontinuity for the amplitude in the flat space limit. But in principle, in CFTs, you can also study quadruple discontinuity, and quadruple discontinuity satisfies crossing. And you can also, and in particular, it's again discussed in the paper by Simon, and you can see, which I guess something like this Ax theorem, that if you impose crossing for quadruple discontinuity, you immediately derive that you need multi-twist operators in the OP, which is sort of analog of a particle production. Okay, so let me switch to the now uh, uh, this analytic uh, bootstrap, and uh, the idea is that. Uh, um, the idea would be uh, again. First, let me uh, let me um, inversion formula quickly, which was our Gibov, and then find a small parameter and uh, in the problem, and then uh, use this small parameter to do some expansions. Um, so something which is very standard and we haven't discussed yet is a. Partial wave expansion. So, if you have an amplitude function of S and T, you can write it as a sum over spins of JFS. And here uh, we put the d dimensional Legendre polynomials. And here I put also a normalization factor. In principle, depends on J. I will define now. It's in a second. So, F J F S is given simply uh, well, here. I put um, the the integral minus one to one. The integral goes over angles. That's as a measure. D is a space time, and you plot T. The expression in terms of the angle, then you integrate against the Legendre polynomial in d dimension. So Legendre polynomials are normalized with this factor. Um, and d of j. In particular, in uh, in four dimensions, this guy uh, this guy is equal two over two j plus one, and you get this two j plus one familiar factor in uh, in the partial wave expansion. Um, so now, as uh, as we discussed yesterday, if we have analytic properties of the amplitude. It just follows from this by some, by some, I guess, simple mathematical theorems that you have this expansion within the ellipse, within the ellipse 
which is known as a Martin Lehmann ellipse, which is drawn here. So it, it, this expansion converges in this region. And uh, also you can uh, uh, discuss what is the condition, what is the unitarity condition in terms of the partial wave. Let me quickly write it. So if you, and here I, I say I follow the conventions of uh, the numerical paper by uh, uh, P.P., T., Van Rees, and V. Uh, so Paulo Spanidonis, Toledo, Van Rees, and Vieira. So if you write your partial waves like this, well, d minus 3 over square root of s. Then uh, the unitarity condition, which is we discussed yesterday, is optical theorem tells you that this is less or equal than 1. So this is unitarity. And uh, Sj equal 1 is elastic unitarity. Uh, now, in terms of uh, in terms of f function, you get the condition that imaginary part of f j, or let me let's say right f j f s is large equal in four minus four n squared d minus three over two. Of S of J square. So this is this is just a rewriting of optical theorem. So it's kinematics. There is nothing here. And again, uh, uh, imaginary part. Remember, there was a Hermitian analyticity. We take the amplitude and its conjugate. So and Hermitian analyticity tells us that taking the conjugate amplitude is going on the other side of the cut, and this is that you get this discontinuity, which is equal to imaginary part for physical S. Uh, now, the idea that we would like to, one can consider is the following. So we have a non-perturbative S matrix. We don't have a coupling. Yeah. Sure, 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 sure. So this, uh, so let, let me explain these lines. So we have the condition S is dagger equal to 1, right? S is equal 1 plus IT, where 1 is a space with disconnected particles. So now uh, sandwich it with two particle state and integrate. Uh, very good. So uh, you're right that, uh, uh, and this is the two, two scattering attribute. And that is only true for a certain regime of S, right? Oh, yes. This is, this is only elastic unitarity, so it's only true depending on what you assume about the spectrum. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the idea is that now we have a problem which uh, does, does not have a naturally small coupling. It's all strongly coupled and quantum, but we want to expand the uh, in something, if we want to do analytical uh, computations, and so we need the small parameter. And one natural small parameter appears as follows. Again, let's go back to elastic unitarity. And uh, we know that the amplitude takes a form. Uh, that imaginary part of the amplitude is equal to the integral of the phase space volume times This is a schematic form, uh, and uh, now you see that uh, one uh, small parameter which appears in this formula is the following. You know that uh, this cut starts at 4m squared. In particular, the available phase space volume close to this point shrinks to zero. So if you go close to this point, you have a small parameter which is the volume of phase space. 
Therefore, if you introduce some parameter, something like you know, um, one minus so four n squared, when c four dimensions, I guess. So it's actually in all dimensions. So the phase space. Yeah, well, the phase space volume is uh, it's has a, it has a it's essentially it has this factor s minus four n square um, to the d minus three over two. Maybe there is something special and happens in d equal three, but in high dimensions, but the, the it's all. Yeah, 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 yeah. But this will apply in all dimensions. So anyhow, so the idea is, and we can try to think maybe it will be uh, would be useful. Or something to expand the amplitude close to this point, close to the threshold, and in particular solve the unitarity condition, the elastic unitarity condition close to the threshold. And, uh, the idea would be then, uh, so essentially, uh, in one line, what will happen then? Uh, you will see that uh, through the inversion formula, which is a frost arc Gibov. Uh, formula this expansion in terms of small sigma or small threshold is turned into large spin expansion. So in, like in CFT, there was a small distance close to the light cone, which turns into large spin expansion. In amplitudes, if you have this expansion close to the threshold, it's also turned into a large spin expansion. But the story here will be a little bit more interesting, and I'll explain why. So, but let's... Uh, Your goal is to find Solve approximately for yeah. this. In yeah, I want to. I want to build the. Yeah, build the expansion of the amplitude close to regime, close to the threshold, which satisfies everything I want. And then, yeah, and then feed it in into the rest to to see what actually is controlled by these parameters. And we will see that the large spin behavior of partial waves is controlled by this expansion. Yeah. 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 So the, uh, these parameters will stay unfixed. Well, some of them will, will be fixed. Well, they be, because, uh, but in general, um, the information about the details of the scattering, uh, I, I cannot fix it. So let me proceed. I'll just do three lines, and then we will see what you get. So let me rewrite this condition slightly. So we can write this as a the i over 2, whatever, f um, on the 1 over 2i, f minus f dagger. This is the imaginary part, so let me divide by f square. And uh, we have the following uh, equation. J star minus J. Yeah, and this is uh, basically this uh, point and this analysis uh, was done by uh, Bros and uh, Jagol Nitzer in 81. So um, you see that uh, you get here uh, the following condition. And here you see that uh, the amplitude, something interesting happens, which is that the even dimensions and odd dimensions behave differently. Because as you see, there is this d minus 3 here. So if you have odd dimensions, uh, w w as we go around the cut here, this is just, uh, uh, in odd dimensions, this is just a polynomial. So it does not develop any discontinuity, whereas in uh, even dimensions, it has a square root structure. 
So again, this is well known, and uh, you can write the most. Uh, um, so the solution to this equation is that. Um, so in uh, let me write in in odd dimensions. So we write the square root over four n squared minus s d minus three. It's just a polynomial around 4m squared, so it cancels this guy. And now we want to have a discontinuity which is equal to one. Here, so we have uh, 1 over pi log sigma plus dj of s, where uh, this, uh, this function is uh, bj of s, they can be of, of sigma, sorry. They can be uh, meromorphic functions of sigma, but they do not have any cuts. So they're analytic around the origin as you uh, as you go. So where did the condition come from? The this? Yeah. Now this is just rewriting of this. We divide it by the right hand side. And so it's it's elastic, yeah, it's elastic unitarity again. Um, in particular, you see that, uh, so yes, this is BJ of, of sigma, it's a meromorphic, it's a, it's a meromorphic function around the origin. It has a, can has a pole, but otherwise it's analytic. And moreover, as we will show in the next five minutes, for, for uh, uh, very close to uh, sigma, when sigma goes to zero, its maximal singularity is one over a. We'll derive that. But in particular, you see that an interesting fact that usually in perturbation theory, you get uh, we get normal thresholds which are logs, but non-perturbatively, for example, in three dimensions, this factor is just one, and the behavior of the amplitude, let's say we consider bj with j equals zero, then there is a constant here. And so the behavior of the amplitude is one over log, non perturbatively. And the coefficient of this one over log is completely fixed. So now there are claims that if you consider phi to the four in three dimensions, so, okay, in general, for, the, for example, for F0 in three dimensions, you can have one over one pi log sigma plus some. Uh, some beta naught, uh, and um, uh, the claim is that in three dimensions, in uh, in uh, phi to the four theory, this be this beta naught is actually zero. So phi to the four in three dimensions, uh, if you go to the gap phase, the amplitude behaves close to the threshold as one over log sigma. That's. Uh, what people claim. Uh, no. so, so, sorry, so so far everything has been uh, true for arbitrary sigma. Have you used the sigma small anywhere so far? Yes. Oh, well, I yeah, I'm, I'm just I, I, I just build the so I'm saying that this is a analytic uh, around the four m squared, so it admits this expansion stuff <laughs> meromorphic, but I haven't used the much that it's small. And I, I just rewrote it. Thanks. Now, uh, in uh, as 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 we said, in uh, in even number of dimensions, uh, in even number of dimensions, the 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 solution to this condition is different because this is not a polynomial; it has a square singularity. So, in even dimensions. Um, you have uh, something like this. Um, plus this. Um, again, let's say, for example, uh, if you consider uh, 
uh, four dimensions. It's a one over square root singularity uh, close to the threshold. And uh, this singularity made its appearance in this numerical work, which I again mentioned so many times already. So in particular, if you remember that, so they do a certain scheme for bootstrap and they found in two dimensions some integrable series. In three dimensions, they maximize the coupling and they again found some um, extreme solution. And this extreme solution has this behavior in four dimensions. It has one over, one over pole. Sorry, uh, not yet. I, I, it's my next step, which is. Uh, it's the case even for Yes, it's always the case. And by the way, so one, one also one piece of terminology. <coughs> so the leading piece, uh, let me call it BJ0, uh, sigma J. This is what is called the scattering length, I think. For example, when people discuss pi in physics, they measure these things, and uh, this is uh, what scattering length is. So things, things, in the, things are really 4 minus s and not s minus 4? Uh, well, here it's, uh, I, I just uh, say if I sit, you know, if I sit below the cut, sigma is uh, positive, but then uh, uh, this guy develops a discontinuity as we go, and I pick this discontinuity. Now to derive, uh, for example, this fact, or at least when we have one way to derive it, um, I would like to, yeah, so here, uh, what, just maybe some punchline, there is no much of a punchline, uh, but the fact that there is a, a natural way of, uh, to solve elastic unitarity, so you might think, okay, maybe now it's, uh, very nice, we impose it, but here if you now write a partial wave expansion of the amplitude, which is uh, some, some of this Fj, the crossing is completely non-manifest. So it's not clear how to impose crossing efficiently. Now, uh, one, uh, as we learned recently again in CFTs, one useful uh, way to think about uh, this kind of problems is to do this inversion formulas. Sorry. So uh, you have just going in one or sigma to the J, right? It's a most singular piece, yeah. Right. So you could already use the strawberry theorems in your yeah. PFST, right? To start talking about large J behavior. <laughs> because you just have uh, something that goes like S to the power of J. Uh, sorry, so... Uh, so you had an expression for PFST in terms of this thing. Uh, uh, yeah. And... Uh, that sum goes from J equals 0 to infinity, and the J now goes to some extra Yeah. Right? So, yeah. so now I can already, knowing, knowing the behavior of PST at smallest, I can start talking about uh, the large J behavior of J. Uh, the large S, can you trust this? Sorry. Uh, here, yeah, here is that oh. sigma is small. It's a small sigma. It's a uh, S close to form square. Right. I mean, uh, well, it's actually the way the way how large spin will appear will be a little bit different, and it's uh, the, the claim would be that this expansion control large spin behavior at any S, not not, not at the not at the smallest or large S. So here, this expansion is close to the. Know, close to the threshold, we can, it's a good expansion. I mean, it's a good. It would be a good expansion close to the threshold, so we can expand in integer powers of sigma, and then we will translate this into some statement about partial waves. I mean, if you saw, I just was wondering how the FJS solves that equation. Okay, let's plug it. So we invert. Sigma, EJ sigma somehow disappears. Sorry. Because that's, uh, Aye, because it doesn't have any cut. Right, it's it's a uh, meromorphic. So yeah. Uh, Sa Sasha, sorry, probably a stupid question. Um, you, 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 when you'd written your unitarity condition in terms of just the S's, the full S matrix, it was just mod S squared is equal to 1, right? That S was a pure phase. Yeah, uh, this would be if there is no production. Yes, as you, let's assume there's... 
there's no production. So that way, we're in the situation you're working with at the moment. Oh, no, no, uh, no, I'm not assuming, I'm, I'm now assuming production, there is no production. There is no production in some region. Oh, maybe, sorry, yes, let's, okay, let's assume it, yeah. So let's assume we are yeah. tenors where there is elastic unitarity. Right, so that's what you were using on this, on the right-hand side, right? Yeah, uh, yeah that, that's what I'm using on the right-hand side. Yeah. Yes, okay, so uh, uh, if I just plug in S is any pure phase, it should meet all your conditions. Um, is that right? I, I was wondering how, uh, um, how just yes. arbitrary pure phase can, be, can have all these interesting analytic structures. Uh, I know it's a stupid question. Uh, Suppose I just plug fj of s as e to the power i sigma alpha j of s, where alpha j is any any function. Uh, yes. Yeah, so let's. Uh, I think if we will solve, uh, if we will solve, that's that's a good point. So you suggest. <laughs> Uh, so this uh, here, so this is something that uh, that uh, happens for physical S, so um, for S larger than four m squared, and now um, I think we should, uh, if we plug this formula into the uh, into the formulas that I wrote, it should we should get that just for S larger than four m squared, uh, b is fixed. <coughs> in terms of this guy. But the important thing is that this formula by itself is not good because if you just plug a phase, this is not consistent with this structure, right? Your phase should be such that the, the S, uh, so um, yeah, the, amplitude, uh, the amplitude has to be real here for, you can show that the amplitude is real between four, zero and four m squared this follows, for example, from dispersion relations. So if you just plug a random phase, it does satisfy this, but note that these conditions here, maybe I have to emphasize that, this is for S larger than 4 m squared. So this phase should know that about this structure. It should, uh, it should become, uh, should disappear for S less than 4 m squared and uh, then appear, and it should also have some analytic properties. And I think that's where the structure comes from, that just random phase will not satisfy what we want. Maybe, or in other words, maybe something which um, we, have to, we have to impose that this... Um, well, one thing we should definitely have to impose that the amplitude is real in this, uh, in this region, and uh, this translates the reality of FJ of S, and then, uh, but otherwise I don't, yeah, I don't so see. I think you want the coefficient, I mean, if you look at your little partial wave actually, you had all this, uh, I mean, the S minus 4 M squared is coming from the relation between E and T and Z. Yeah. So, so <laughs> well, uh, you can, you can, you can define this as F tilde, and then there is no, um, you know, there is no all this no, business. <coughs> yeah, there is a so this, there is a there is a branch cut here in uh, even dimensions. <coughs> Sorry, been that's been important. Yeah. Um, yeah, but here you made it. You made it. Yes, I think one of the things that the point is that delta G of S cannot just be real for S less than one. Actually. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Because capital S is real for when little s is less than 4x squared. Oh, that's okay. So I think delta j is something which is imaginary for s more than 4x squared and real because that's not. Yeah, so then, then it has to be, has proper analytic properties, has a correct analytic properties, and I think that's, that's all it is. So it has a branch. Well, I mean, I, I was solving exactly this problem, right? So let's do change of variables. It has to be the same. I, I don't, maybe it's a, it's a better way to say that, but. Okay, thanks. So essentially, since there's some non-polarity thing, I mean, you're saying this is the only function which has property that delta j is real for s smaller forms. Uh, I think that maybe, yeah. Uh, the claims that I would like to make that this is uh, the most general solution of elastic unitar close to this, yeah. 
close to this region. Just look at it like this. Dj of sigma is anything which is uh, yeah. expansion policy. Yeah. Yeah. That's as general as I mean, I guess, yeah, if you're very close to the, the threshold, then, then, then this is scary. Yeah, if you're very close to the threshold, you, there's some universal piece that uh, log captures it. Yeah. Mm. So, oh, it's 12. Okay, can I continue a little bit? Okay. So, uh, let's quickly introduce uh, Asar. Grib of representation, which is very, which is very simple uh, in this case. So we uh, let me avoid the issue of these two subtractions, which are always in principle there, and uh, this you know, we have two cuts: S channel cut and U channel cut. So let for simplicity something like dispersion relation without subtractions. Um, so we write it as a print well, and then we write it as a form squared infinity ds prime ts s prime minus s as a function of s prime. And now uh, we uh, uh, we would like to plug here the partial wave expansion. So if we plug uh, uh, here a partial wave, oh, oh sorry, we, that's not, let me not, what we would like to do is we, we want to plug this formula into, into this formula. And therefore you see that um, uh, not, even, not even this formula. So there is, a, there is an expression for FJFS as an integral over the angles of T as uh, angle as a function of T against the Legendre polynomial. And um, let's plug uh, here uh, this formula. So we get uh, um, oh, sorry, uh, uh, please forgive me. I want to switch to this dispersion relation. Um, and uh, if we plug this uh, integral here, we, all the dependence on T is in the prefactor. That's why I wanted to switch to this dispersion relation. So we just need to integrate one over t prime minus t against the Legendre polynomial in this formula, and uh, what we are what we are left with is the integral of dt prime from four n squared to infinity, and here uh, we get this this integral of. is written there in the in this corner against this t prime minus t produces this what's known as a Kulish under polynomial as a function of t prime. So this uh, Kulish under polynomials the uh, this other solution of the second order differential equations. So let me write it vaguely and I will write uh, precisely um, And uh, now uh, we then this is the first argument formula. So we write the part, we wrote the partial wave as an integral of a double disc, of, of a discontinuity from dispersion relation. And instead of this PJ Legendre polynomials, there are other solutions of the same differential equations that appear here. And this uh, uh, this Q polynomials and this formula allows to uh, well, I avoided some because it's identical particles. We do not have um, uh, you know, odd partial waves, we have only even partial waves, and so in principle there are <laughs> sort of, you have to be careful about even and odd spins, but the punchline is that you can continue in spin. 
you know, you've probably already heard this story many times. So. Let me write maybe a quickly a precise formula for the record. Okay, I had it somewhere. Maybe I don't. Okay. So, for identical particles, the formula takes this 2, 4 m squared to infinity. We have uh, 2 dt over s minus 4 m squared. We have, uh, from this uh, measure, v squared minus 1, v minus 4 over 2. From the measure of the genre, we have Q, J of Z. Um, so let me write some prefactors. This is not important. Um, and here you have a discontinuity in T. Uh, now, uh, an important fact about this, uh, uh, this Legendre's with QJ is that if you look, so you see the integral go from the threshold to infinity. Uh, an important, very basic observation about this Legendre's, for example, let me write um, for the record this formula in 3D. So in 3D, you have 4m squared. Infinity, you can check that this formula becomes the t square root t s plus t minus 4m squared. And uh, here you have s minus 4m squared to the j. And you have t to the j. One plus square root s minus four and squared to the t to the j and discontinuity. Um, so you see here the, the basic uh, the basic observation is that well the basic known fact about this formula is that uh, if you um, if you increase uh, if you increase spin, you have uh, you have here. Well, let me divide by four and squared to make it dimensionless. Um, uh, the basic fact is that this is a fa decays very quickly. So uh, if you take an, any any function here, expand it around the threshold, which is t equal 4 m squared, and you uh, uh, run it through this integral, you will see that the expansion close to the threshold t equal 4 m squared becomes an expansion at large spin. And the way it works is that, uh, again, that uh, simply if you, uh, um, you know, if you, if you do this integral, you will get very quick damping of this, everything that comes uh, from highs and four and squared. That's my question. You have s upon four and square minus one to the power Yeah. You are restricted to s greater than Well, actually, in this formula, no, no. It's uh, this is just a polynomial here. I will do. Let's do integer spin. So, this is uh, just a pure power. If you want to analytically continue, or yes, I mean, so I mean, this can become imaginary, right? If uh, if this is minus Well, j is integer, right? Yes. 
J is integer and even. Yeah, yeah it's uh, <coughs> for identical particles, it's even, so I, uh, I haven't uh, um, and so the the, uh, the idea, for example, uh, if you if you take uh, and let me again motivate this by uh, by connection to this um, um, to this numerical paper, for example, in four dimensions, the most singular behavior of the amplitude, which is consistent with elastic unitarity, that you can get from this formula, is uh, um, something which is the leading term in this expansion. Was a fixed coefficient, which is some, uh, I don't remember it, it's some 32 pi or something, takes this form. Plus something which is uh, suppressed by integer powers of sigma. <coughs> um, this is fixed. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, so if you give you a large J expansion, yeah. as long as you are very close to the threshold. Um, well, I, I would like to say that um, this. The that you are talking about, this peak of the right? Yes, if you, if you, so we are integrating, a, a, you know, we're integrating over all T's. When T is very large, this is very suppressed. That's so in a sense, and and these amplitudes, so this uh, um, this imaginary part, it's polynomially bounded uh, function. Uh, so um, it's um, I agree. You can uh, you can in principle then estimate the error based on the on the behavior of this thing. I guess at the moment I'm saying is that if you if you write your amplitude. If you write an amplitude, as if you expand it around the threshold and you plug into this formula, you will see that this expansion is just turned into one over J expansion. Maybe that's only claim I'm making. And the, the reason you is it's happening, you will see that essentially um, this integration, if you make some change of variables and you take J to be large, in the large J limit, it becomes an exponential decay, an exponentially decaying kernel. For example, here, you know, if you take t equal, t equal 4 and squared equal 1 plus x over j, something like this, this becomes e to the minus x. So it zooms, uh, it's the, it, it probes the amplitude at the region which shrinks <laughs> as a spin. Okay, that's, that's a basic observation. And now, um, this, uh, uh, what was the, uh, let me just summarize the set of steps. Ah, Sa Sa Sasha, sorry, um, again, stupid question. It seems to me that from what you said, um, large spins only contribute near the threshold. The reverse doesn't seem to me to follow. Uh, sorry, say again, uh, large spins, uh, large spins is... Um, only contribute near the threshold. Yeah. So, or... But, uh, yeah. But, but, but you seem to be saying that the behavior near the threshold is dominated only by large spins. I don't see that. that oh, no, way. no, 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 sorry. We feed in, we feed in. Uh, so what I'm saying is that if you plug a threshold expansion into this formula, in the left-hand side, so uh, in the left-hand side it's turned to, uh, so these powers of t minus 4 n square are turned into a powers of 1 over j at large spin. So uh, the input, the input is a, so I'm giving, if I'm giving a yeah. threshold expansion, oh, I, I see. Thank you. I yeah, can thank you. The large spin expansion. That's a okay. Uh, which one? This one? So this is a, so this is a, the, the the most leading uh, the most leading terms that I can uh, have in four dimensions. In four dimensions, that's right. Yeah, I'm, I'm sticking to this paper. I've just taken a four-dimensional case to... Um, 
sorry, this is yes, but uh, the, okay, that's very good. So the, the claim is that the behavior of the under polynomials, the, the, the behavior of um, uh, so um, q j of z behaves as uh, z plus square root z minus one <coughs> to the j minus j <coughs> in any number of dimensions, and z uh, z essentially starts from uh, from here when uh, z equal when t equal four and square z is larger than one. You remember this four and square. Say uh, z is one plus two t over s minus four and squared. So if you um, if you take, um, for example, s um, close to four and square from above, is that uh, you see that this is uh, just a or from below, for that matter, it doesn't mean doesn't it doesn't doesn't matter when t becomes four and square, z is larger than one, and so uh, uh, you're integrating from one to infinity, and at large j, this factor is always larger than one. So that's that's the idea, and this formula is indeed only in three dimensions. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry, Sasha. To check if I'm understanding, um, your, when you write down your 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 expansion in terms of partial waves, you're writing down as if S is the center of mass, energy, and T is T is like the angle variable. Is that right? Yeah. But then you pl you use that formula and you go to the threshold in T rather than in S. Yeah, 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 yeah. So well, I assume crossing symmetry. No, I assume crossing symmetry, yes. and this is the same. This is the same expansion in dual channel. I did. Yes. Yeah. yeah, but it's sort of important for your whole thing that you you write the expansion in like an S center of mass, but then you use it on the T threshold, right? That that's sort of important for the whole. Um, thing. Yeah. So well, uh, it's um, it's a very, the crossing is uh, crossing will be indeed the. Crucial here, I'm feeding T channel threshold expansion to get the behavior of S channel partial waves. That's a sort of a usual, I guess. Yeah, intuition. thanks. Yeah, yeah. so the, the vague, yeah, <laughs> sorry. I'm still a little confused by it. So if you have an equal four, uh, I mean, there is that piece which uh, in the T channel will be the, the square root piece. But I thought we were trying to show that the BJ of sigma uh, I mean, the, the BJ of C, for D4, that's square root of sigma, but the BJ Yeah, for, this is, this, yes, this is the J equals 0 piece. This is the J equals 0 piece. Oh, I see. So you... And for, for, uh, um, for... Uh, for higher J, the, the other terms would dominate. And I thought that's what you are trying to show now. Or, uh, um, going to no, no, I, I, actually, this, uh, this, uh, um, this factor sigma, this factor of sigma of j, um, I uh, I wanted to uh, to argue for that just using this factor here, but then uh, I think if uh, you will, uh, so this uh, the, this behavior of sigma j is uh, is translated to this behavior of f j. But I was going into the uh, in the direction now. I'm. I would like to see that some finite s. So s is not close to the threshold anymore. And I'm just plugging some uh, expansion of the amplitude. You can consider it this or something else. There is an expansion and which is consistent with elastic unitarity. I can keep it as a symbol. It doesn't matter for me now. Let's just you have some expansion of the amplitude in some form. And uh, so this is an example which I will feed into inversion formulas and see what it gives. So and the claim would be that whatever your expansion is of the amplitude close to the threshold is transformed into the large spin statement at any s. Um, yeah, but maybe there is not, yeah, there is not much more, I guess. Square root of <laughs> this, is a, yeah, this is a cartoon function. I think that's the most singular behavior consistent with elastic unitarity in four dimensions. And this is what these guys observed. For example, <laughs> this coefficient is numerical work. Sasha? Yeah. Sasha, just to make sure that I understand, this T channel uh, threshold behavior that you obtained, 
did you obtain it using the solutions for the FJs that you had uh, near the threshold on, on, the, on the right hand side of the board? Yes, uh, uh, this is, I think, uh, your. I'm, I think I, I'm not explaining it well because I don't understand it well. Uh, so, in principle, you can you can ask again what is the relation between uh, within this expansion and uh, and the expansion of the amplitude and uh, because in principle you you have to you know you have to sum over partial weights and um, and then you might worry that uh, um, for example these statements about partial wave which are correct you can ask what are they translated to in general for the behavior of the amplitude and uh, yes. I uh, I think that it's easier for the amplitude it's easier to do this threshold expression directly in the elastic unitarity for the amplitude and I expect that you will get some uh, expansion like this but uh, uh, so it's motivated by the fact that the date to the zero is yeah, yeah it's motivated and I think uh, I think it's also if we, if we if if you write if you write the elastic unitarity for um, for just amplitude without partial wave, and you plug this formula, it will be satisfied. That's a, just just the solution of elastic unitarity, which is singular. And then uh, we can write it. We can dress this solution by by expanding it in this in this powers of t minus four m squared with some coefficients. And then uh, the exact the direct relation between coefficients uh, here, I think the the, rela the relation is direct. So this is just a zero. For other guys, um, I haven't said anything about that. <laughs> well, I can ask it the other way around. If the summing is a problem, then if I take this and then expand into the partial waves, do, 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 do I get uh, the kind of solutions that you wrote down for the partial I waves? Think, I think so, yeah, yeah. Well, this is just F0, right? This is F0. I have written it here. Zero. Ah, OK. I only, have, I only have written here F0, and F0 gives directly. Ah, OK. I see, OK. I see, sorry. Yes, thank you. Sorry for being not, not being clear. Uh, now uh, I will just write the, the state steps and the results. So there is nice things that happen. Sorry, Sasha. Yeah, yeah. In conform theory, you have this twist uh, which controls the spin, right? In yeah. one channel. So yeah. what is the analog of twist here? So how, how are you going to get... Uh, um, yeah. The next here, yeah, so here is the, is the spin in the other channel control control that. No, no. Here, here is the these powers which uh, so these are powers of this expansion of the amplitude. These powers are directly becomes they become powers of uh, uh, in one over j expansion. So I don't know. Uh, uh, if I can say more than that, so you, you, if you, you know, if you, you see that the integral is dominated close to the threshold, this is a relevant scaling at large spin, and then you see that, uh, you know, if you have the t over four minus square minus one to some power, it becomes x over j to some power. Yes, that's uh, okay. What happens? But an important thing is that important thing to be said is that. You see that here there are these uh, Legendre polynomials, and um, as I told you, that the integral starts from 4m squared in this case. So there is always a b factor of this qj of z0, where z0 is this value 1 plus 4m squared, s minus 4m squared, and this is dressed by uh, expansion in powers of j. So there is a universal factor just coming from this threshold, and then the fluctuations around the threshold, if you wish, uh, becomes expansion in 1 over j. Um, so that's a statement about f. Another nice statement, uh, which I haven't uh, maybe explained too much, but you already uh, yeah, probably see. Sorry, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. This, this factor is independent of this dimension, I think, right? Sorry, say again? Uh, here, the, the, the large j story, the, the formula that you wrote after QJ, that, that zero g to the power. Yeah. That, that d does not enter. 
Well, D will enter, I think, in the, in the form of the behavior of Legendre polynomials close to the threshold. So when you try to expand this guy and take a scaling limit close to the threshold, things will depend on Z. So, we, we see, we, we, for large uh, this one? Oh, yeah, sorry. This is, uh, um, this is not, uh, this is a vague formula. There is, I think there is some, there are prefactors here, which are d-dependent. And I think uh, if you write them carefully in the end, I, I'm not sure, but I think d-dependence, I, I can check the d-dependence will enter. And, uh, uh, yeah, but it enters only, it, it just enters through this, through this uh, structure and through the structure of the threshold expansion. Yeah. Um, now, uh, one, one nice fact is that, which, which again, based on the same thing that, um, the phase space over which we're integrating becomes small close to the threshold is that, remember we have a, uh, this picture with, a, you know, with a, um, with the Land called Landau or Karplus curves and the spectral density in uh, in this region, was, in this region was given by by the integral of continuity, and uh, what happens is that what happens is that by the same argument, when you close, uh, if you consider expansion of the row close to the Landau curve, say here, it's again controlled by the threshold expansion. So you see the same same thing happens. If you go to the very first formula that I draw, wrote today in the blackboard for the elastic unitarity and for the spe double spectral density in terms of it, you see that if you start pushing yourself very close to Landau curve, everything becomes again squeezed close to the threshold. And therefore you can find, if you say, for example, feed this formula into this formula, you will find that uh, the leading contribution for the um, for the raw, and it, it, it has this Landau curve, theta function times, times alpha squared, which comes from the fact, let me denote this by alpha, comes from the fact that there is alpha here, uh, and then you will, so what, for example, if you do this exercise in four dimensions, um, uh, there is, uh, say, T minus, uh, it's called sometimes T plus S, this Landau curve, square root. So if I call this e T plus S, so this is the leading term close to here. And uh, therefore, you can now, so we use this threshold expansion to compute the leading asymptotic of F. We use this threshold expansion to compute the leading asymptotic of Rho. And we can now uh, uh, go and use the crossing. By crossing, similarly, we know the leading asymptotic of spectral density here. So we can now go to the frosar grieber formula and take its imaginary part. And so we will get that imaginary part of F is equal to the same thing, but here you get raw. And in particular, uh, this integral will start now not from 4m squared, but it starts at some uh, t min of s, which is just, say, uh, if on this picture it's s and this is t, um, then uh, as we, for example, consider um, s between 4 and 16, the t, t will start here. So Sorry. now you want to uh, look at the double spectral density. Yeah, I'm, and, uh, I'm, I'm making a, yes. Uh, and, but now your threshold there is, uh, you're looking near the curve. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, only near 
uh, only, I mean, it's not quite the same as the C minus 4 and so Yeah, it's, it's, it's different. It, no, no, it's very different. Yeah, it's a different curve. It's a very different curve. But the, the, the point is that the, the, the behavior of this curve through the elastic unitarity integral, which defines this curve, sure. is controlled by t close to threshold. That's a claim. So if you know t close to threshold, you plug into this integral. T close to this threshold. Close to this threshold, you plug into this elastic unitarity integral, you get the expansion for rho close to Landau curve. So what is the argument? I, I, oh, that's a fact about the, the you just... You just see, so remember there was this formula theta z minus eta plus integral from a1 to the s, blah, blah, blah. And so you see that uh, just this, uh, this, integral, this integral goes from uh, a1 to infinity, a1 to infinity. But uh, this theta function squeezes this integral close to this threshold. And so... Uh, uh, it just happens to be. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's sort of expected by the meaning of the double spectral density. And now the last step is that you can now, after you see oh, that... Excuse me, Sasha. Sorry, can I just go back a bit? The partial wave, external partial wave coefficients that you obtained towards the left of the board, yeah. uh, there, uh, when you go to the close to the threshold, yeah. Do they have the same type of behavior that you expect? This log or whatever, the, 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 the expect, you have some expectation for that behavior near the threshold, right? Yeah, so here, th this would be a different regime from which I would like to discuss now, which is because now I keep S fixed and potentially large, but by consistency it, it has to be, I, 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 haven't, I haven't demonstrated it on the, on the board. I see. I see. But it, is, it looks non-trivial that it would be, right? I mean, yeah, it's uh, non-trivial. And this, uh, for example, this uh, scattering length through this formula, they, they become moments of discontinuity. <laughs> From this, you get, for example, this famous constraint that the scattering length, they solve a moment problem, so the scattering length has to lie on a convex curve. And this is a consistency condition of this formula close to threshold. So this, this guy drops down, drops out, this produces this pole, uh -huh. J. Then you get the formula for Bj as just the limit of this formula when you set S close to 4 and squared. And then you get the integral of this amplitude, and uh, this, which defines a scattering length. And here you get the pure power of T. And so you get this moment problem, and then there is a non-trivial set of consistency conditions, which... I see. But I agree this is Yeah, so here, so I, I would like now, you can take in principle imaginary part of Frosar Bibov, and you see that if you take imaginary part of the partial wave, so here, if you, you, get, the, you get the double spectral density, and so again, if you take a large spin of this guy, this, it localizes close to the, this thing, and the fluctuation, again, are described by 1, one over j expansion. So the, the punchline punch is essentially that if you plug threshold expansion, and you use, uh, if you have a threshold expansion and crossing, you can compute uh, this, the imaginary part, and the f itself at large spin, and you get this um, result. Uh, let me write it, for example, for... Um, and, uh, and now I would like to, to, to show you that. So, uh, you know, the let's, so let's say we did this computation. You can ask, uh, is, uh, what is the... Remember that... You can ask what happens to elastic unitarity or what is the amount of an elasticity that we have at given energies and large spin. And uh, recall that, uh, so let's say I, I did it in, in uh, okay, let me write it like this. Um, so this is the punchline now, uh, and I will finish. So you can write this ratio, imaginary part of f. S is fixed, j will be large. And uh, uh, 
uh, you can uh, do what I just uh, told you and uh, get the lead behavior is just completely fixed. So there is some prefactor which is polynomial in S or some square root, it doesn't matter. It's not important, but the important prefactor is that you get here is a QJ of uh, 1 plus uh, 2 plus, okay, I'm, let me write it like this, say 4 n squared uh, s minus 16 n squared 8 n squared s. Um, and that's that's right. So this is a uh, uh, yeah. That's right. This this argument comes about. So th this is an important part. This is a uh, uh, this minimal value of imaginary part comes from the fact that we have a Landau curve. And therefore, in the Prosser group of integrals, is this minimal value dictated by this. And so the, everything is dominated by qj close to this value. So this value here comes just from the location of Landau curve. It's kinematical. Sorry, yeah. Yes, please, please, please. So this statement didn't use the elastic unit either. Oh, because this is this is just from the definition of yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. So that's why, yeah, 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 that's why we will get inelastic results now. Okay. Uh, so you're saying the inelasticity is captured by the right hand side. It's. Uh, and, uh, so, uh, so far we just use a crossing and we did this computation and we used, so in the first lecture we tried to push elastic unitarity all the way. Now I'm using it in the region where it has to be. And so we, sh we see that uh, uh, we can use it and uh, to compute this ratio at large spin. And uh, the leading term, the leading term in this ratio at large spin is given by... Um, by this result. And here we get, I think, 64. So now, and this factor might look uh, a little bit uh, unclear to you, where it comes. Um, uh, so yes, yeah, the numerator I can I can I can explain it a little bit. It comes about as follows. So let's compute what is this thing. I can maybe I should write it down somewhere. So, so this uh, this t. Well, yeah, let's derive the numerator quickly. So um, we had this formula. Uh, that um, uh, whatever t was larger than uh, 16 m squared plus 64 m to the 4 s minus 4 m squared. Um, so now, uh, This is, uh, uh, this is this curve. In the Frossard group of integral, we are integrating over t. So we, we have to, when, when t is close to the threshold between 4 and 16, we have to use elastic unitarity in the dual channel, which is here. This is a relevant Landau curve. So the relevant Landau curve for us is a crossing symmetric of this which is that S is larger than 4, 16 M squared plus 64 N to the 4, T to the minus 4 M squared. Now, uh, we, this 
argument of the Q polynomial comes from the boundary of Landau curve. So let's put here an equal sign. Therefore, we find from here T as a function of S. And now we go and plug this T as a function of S into Z, which is 1 plus 2T over S minus 4M squared. And if you, you can check that if you solve this equation for T, plug it here, you get this S minus 4M squared right away, and the rest comes from just the solution. But I didn't understand why you said the crossing. Okay, so uh, you see, so uh, so the the uh, re leading leading uh, so the one one elastic unitarity strip is uh, s between uh, say four and sixteen, and t starts way above um, sixteen. On the other hand, the dual one dot curve you can apply for t between four and sixteen. So that's why we, we use a crossing. And that's, again, after you use this crossing, that's where inelasticity comes from. But in the cross-site report, if yeah. you were showing... Uh, I'm doing from, uh, t from 4 to infinity. So you fix a value of s, yeah. which is... Uh, yes, let's say we fix s somewhere here, yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and so... you are integrating there, and you, are, you say you're getting the contribution. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the idea. And now, uh, if you uh, take this result. So that was the numerator and the denominator. Oh, yes. The, square, exactly. Right? Very good. So uh, let's do the denominator. So we have fj, which was coming from the boundary of qj uh, of z0, where z0 was 1 plus. 2 times 4 squared over s minus 4 squared. This is just a threshold, right? This is just this 4m squared that appeared here. This is a boundary. Now, as you take uh, its square, you get qj to z0 square, right? Now there is a claim. You, you can derive the formula if you take qj to z0 square over qj 2 z naught square minus 1 at large j. This is some power of j times the number. This is a formula which I haven't explained to you, but it's, this is a fact about this q things. And so if you take, yeah, you get rid of the square. So if you take the z naught, plug it in this formula, you will get this. You will get this. There's a square in the denominator. No, 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 there is no. In the argument of the QJ. It's on the, two Z. On the left. On the left. On the left. The dimensions are not. In the denominator of the big track. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. That's square. Uh, and so now you can ask uh, for which, for which, s. So you know if elastic unitarity would hold, this thing should be equal to one. And uh, but if you look at this formula, so at large, uh, at large j, this becomes exponentially small, because as you increase s, you get these things, and these things work such that. Uh, the, the exponents are not the same, and, and, and they, they are equal at exactly this point, say so f20m squared. So they are equal, but above the, uh, the, the denominator q decays much faster. So we get that this exp that at large s, or at s larger than 20m squared, it becomes much larger than 1. A large spin. So this is a result for large j. Large j. The, uh, for the inelastic, so you get your writing down an expression essentially yeah. about for the inelasticity at large j. Yes. How yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, right. And uh, there's no other assumption other than large j that we would. Mm, 
No, no. So does the shaft contain some powers of G? Sorry? This thing contains some powers of G? Uh, I, yeah, actually, it's, I think uh, say in four dimensions at least it doesn't, for the leading piece. Yes, yes, but there are also other powers of J, which come, comes out at uh, in cancel. And sorry, this is in some form, maybe in slightly different terms, but basically this was, um, this was done uh, in 64 or something by Dragd. The guy in Dragd, maybe it's just a few wrinkles on top of that. So he observed that basically... Uh, this happens, and uh, you can compute these ratios. So let me uh, uh, let me conclude the talk by uh, stating uh, um, by by saying. So you can ask if we have a large J expansion, uh, and that we have to have an elasticity. What is the amount? Uh, so, so, sorry, Sasha, that, that right, the right-hand side of your inelasticity formula, yes. um, uh, you probably said it, but at least I didn't catch it. How, how does it grow with J? What kind uh, of function? Okay, so this, uh, the leading piece is, uh, well, um, so let... S-dependent piece is exponential. Yeah, so let me, if I define uh, lambda of Z as a Z plus square root and uh, this is a Z numerator, and this is a Z denominator. The leading behavior is uh, lambda, uh, num lambda of Z numerator, lambda Z denominator, to the power minus J. That's the leading behavior. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Sorry? D R D R A G T. Yeah. So, uh, yes, to conclude, that, that, uh, you can ask, uh, you can ask, uh, okay, how. Well, it's a, so I derived to you a large J formula. Um, but what happens if you don't assume anything about the form of the amplitude? Uh, sorry, and let me emphasize also that uh, this QJ, QJ thinks it will always come about, but uh, it's always it's universal. But this thing, uh, this thing will depend on a particular form of the threshold expansion that you have. So depending on this, you will get something else in the prefactor, but the, this thing is universal. And so, uh, yeah, to conclude is that uh, there was this paper, again, but it was an interesting, very interesting numerical analysis. And in four dimensions, they look for the S matrix, which maximizes amplitude at the uh, value for third, for third, for third. So S equal T equal U is equal to 4M squared over 3. And this is in the bootstrap literature. This is a sort of what's called coupling. So this measures the coupling. You would like to maximize it. And people did it since ancient times. So in this numerical work, um, uh, this col collaboration found that they see a solution which maximizes um, this amplitude numerically. And it has this pole, uh, uh, but uh, if you try to uh, plot the partial waves, they look uh, um, they look like almost uh, at least to the precision that they can compute. They 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 look pure, purely elastic. Um, this is not a conclusive statement, and. Uh, but it's puzzling from the point of view of what I said. On one hand, it's um, it's not maybe very puzzling because in the ansatz that they're using, there is no elastic unitarity. And for example, a double spectral density has a support not here as dictated by elastic unitarity, but there double spectral density starts at 4, 4. So it feels here. 
but um, it seems to be some S matrix, which is very special, which is somehow analogous to this integrable theories in two dimensions. And its properties are very puzzling because it looks like it's almost purely elastic on one hand, but on the other hand, yeah. So does it have a large G expansion? Yes, sorry. This answer, the thing, the thing you get from maximizing this, does it have a large G expansion? I think it does. Because they derived in partial waves. Uh, sorry, which thing? And the answer of uh, VRI and uh, Oh, well, they, sorry, so they, their ansatz, it's a numerical work, and uh, they truncate and spin. Uh, so, so, but they're working at large spin or? Small spin. Small spin, okay. Small spin, they're yeah. They're working for small spin. They're, they're working for small spin. Chances, it's just zero. You're saying the partial waves for some j are just zero. No, no, uh, sorry, okay, I, I, if, if you have time, I can tell what they're doing, but I don't know if I can, if I should wrap up. I, so what they're doing is that, they write an amplitude as an expansion in this row variable which maps the plane to the disk. So they have this, just a, it's a complex map. And they, they write an ansatz which is manifestly crossing symmetric. And then uh, they truncate it as a polynomial in this variable row. So at this, po at this point, they impose an ellicticity and they impose crossing. So what is left is to impose unitarity. And this they impose for SJ, for truncated J, J max. To rephrase my question, the approximation they're making are compatible with large J expansion? Um, is it like the approximation they're making is what is it like? OK, so uh, J max, actually, that's a, it's a property of the scheme. Uh, my impression is that their amplitude, so it's a little bit different from conformal bootstrap, but their amplitude, if you try to push J max too far, probably it will violate unitarity. Because their amplitude is a really some truncated polynomial, if you wish, of the real amplitude. So they, the way they do the work numerically, they correlate their cutoff on the polynomial of the amplitude with the maximal power of spin for which they impose unitarity. That's my understanding. And therefore, there is somehow some floating procedure which they found practically that it works. So in principle, their amplitude it has all the partial waves, but you're not supposed to think of higher partial waves as physical or something, something like this. But the statement is that if you uh, use the J-thing, their J-max into yeah. your formula, you get, a, but you get something that is much bigger than one. Uh, yeah, for, so for their, for their formula, this was, uh, first of all, so here we, we heavily used elastic unitarity, and uh, there they do not have it. So all the structure is gone. So it doesn't, have to, it doesn't have to be there, and you don't see it. But they say that numerically, as they zoom on this extremal solution, they observe that sort of elastic unitarity emerges as if or something like elasticity seemed to be emerging. But what exactly is happening so, is not clear at the moment. When you say they don't impose it, what is the spectrum of the theory? Spectrum? Yeah. The they, spectrum okay, the they impose the following things. They impose exactly what I, they're doing exactly what I was doing. So you have two cuts at 4m squared. You have a 2 to 2 of identical scalars, that's it. And then, and then you, so usually depending on what you assume about the spectrum, you can have this you know, thresholds at 4m squared or 16m squared, and then you have to say, okay, here it's elastic unitarity, but they do not do that. They just say, here, as j is a less or equal than 1. That's How it. Can they do that? I mean, sorry, no, good, good. Okay. Uh, what is the justification for doing that? Between 4m squared and 9m squared, you, you have to impose elastic unitarity, right? You're just forced to do that. Uh, yes, right, but you can say that, let me explore the space of S matrices, without imposing elastic unitarity. But then you're saying there's some other spectrum. There must be, you can't and Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you can have, for example, if you don't have elastic unitarity, imagine you have degeneracy and you have extra states, which, yeah, 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 yeah. In a, physically. Spectrum with a single light scale of n Yeah, 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 yeah. You can say, you can say that probably, yes. So you're saying actually the result has a problem? Uh, it's, I, I don't understand. I think that there is a, there is a, puzzle because they observe from their ansatz, which at least 
So they, 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 they come up with some procedure, and this procedure seems to converge to some maximal solution. But what is the nature of this solution in high dimensions is not clear. For example, what are the properties of this solution? Does it have a unitarity S exactly one all the way for some partial waves? What is the amount of inelasticity that it has? At the moment, uh, this is not known. Yeah, so it's, uh, it seems that the, the, the amplitude violates this structure from the start because their ansatz has double spectral densities right, right away. On the other hand, they say that numerically, at least, uh, they observe as they zoom into the solution, they, they see the SJ is going to one, <coughs> or some of them. So something is going on, they converge to something, but what this something is, is very interesting because it's some very specialist matrix, but I think at the moment, we don't know. Maybe it's just some random function which happened to maximize coupling, which has nothing to do with physical amplitudes. But still, it would be nice to know this as matrix exactly. Can they extract information like uh, the forward scattering limit in the largest? They didn't. They don't discuss that. I believe their amplitude decays at large s, but this has to be again check again. So, thank you.